Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall. And today I have Mike Isratel, as you'll all be very well aware of who Mike is. He is wearing the Revive Stronger t-shirt, so I'm very happy to have that there. Uh, he is in his new digs, aren't you, Mike? New flat, in it. Um, so yeah, yeah, I moved to a new, new place, uptown, so to speak. It's not technically uptown at all. Um, and uh, my parole officer says that if I don't commit any further crimes, I can stay there. So that's all good. And uh, Mike was just explaining to me how he's really close to his gym and can commit to three day um, training sessions. And now everyone listening is going to be like, Mike, I want to be doing your split. So <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> I don't want to be doing my split. Um, yeah, I figured because I have a jujitsu, my jujitsu gym like literally down the street and the weightlifting gym, like another block down. Uh, I just can't, I, Jared Feather and I live really close together now. He moved to Philadelphia. So we just can't, I mean, she does two a days anyway. And I was like, ah, fuck it. I'll do two a day. It's just better for performance. Um, and cause it's so close. I mean, it's really just it's the same amount of time working out. And uh, as far as, you know, my jujitsu gym, like, geez, if I can go in there and just get a couple of rolls and then come home, why wouldn't I? So the three days aren't like three big workouts, right? But they're definitely three distinct sessions. And uh, it's only a couple, I think two, three days a week, three, two a days. Uh, and then like uh, one, one a day or something like that. That makes sense. Yep. yep. So, and then an off day. That's and you, a lot. <laughs> you pushed into the 260s now, 260 pounds, right? Yes, yeah, so I was 262 plus this morning and not super fat, just kind of fat, probably somewhere between 13 and 16%. So like, and it could be, could be as, as low as 13, 14 might be as high as 16. You know, never quite tell, but, um, I have veins in my arms. Um, I, um, I can't pinch off a ton of fat. So it's a lot of it's intra abdominal. Uh, and my face doesn't look like super puffy, you know, like bloat face puffy. Yeah, I know the so, <laughs> Yeah, de- for sure. Definitely the leanest 260 plus I've ever been by long shot. And my gym numbers reflect it. Um, so training is going super, super well. Um, and a lot of that, man, I really do have to take, um, at some point, you know, you and I can discuss this further, but, um, you know, people ever now to ask like, what is it, that, what were the changes you made? that they got you this new level of size. And of course, some of them were with Broderick uh, Chavez, uh, the sports supplement side, which is actually taking less sports supplements, just the healthier right. ones and slash the, well, yeah, which is great, right? Yeah. Uh, healthier ones slash the ones that are just better engineered for doing this job. And another part was actually um, opening my mind up to um, uh, other folks like Eric Helms has been a big influence on me lately, um, particularly with certain things he said about um, you know, not uh, sort of overbearing the exercises and building momentum. And then uh, Menno Henselman's uh, influence on me with uh, microloading, not the microloading per se, though I have done that before with, with good benefit. Just the idea that you don't need to hop up five kilos every time you go to right. the gym on exercises. Now, like some exercises, I'll just add a repetition per set every time. Some exercises, one week I'll add a rep, one week I'll add, you know, 1.25 kilos or something. And just those slow progressions um, and keeping the exercises in for two to four mesocycles at a time has just allowed for this just real consistency in training. And by consistency, I mean, I don't have to refigure my MEVs and MRVs all the time because I'm switching exercises. And, And my technique is always really sharp and I'm just slowly building strength. And with the hypercaloric environment and the pharmacological environment via Broderick, it just makes it, it makes me a very, very low injury. And it just, it's, it's getting me tons and tons of just kind of safe, almost guaranteed growth, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's been really, really big. So I think that, you know, and another one is, um, you know, it's funny. You, see, you sometimes you come up with shit and, and, and then you yourself have to remind yourself to do it. You know, um, uh, I've been, before I thought my MEV was higher than it really was, I think. 
So I've dipped lower on the bottom end of training volume mm -hmm. and realized my MEV for especially some of my muscle groups, like my triceps and chest and front delts are like really fast twitch, really explosive. And their MEV is like frighteningly low. Like I don't even want to say it on air because people are going to be like, that's nonsense. <laughs> but um, I've dipped lower and slowly built up and, and that's made a world of difference in creating momentum and things like that. And um, another one is re-examining my earlier views on muscle soreness. Um, I think Lyle McDonald was right. <laughs> Just fucking with you guys. But um, so, uh, you know, I think that there is a good argument to be made that if you never get sore, uh, you probably not getting the most out of your training. But there's also a very good argument to be made that if you get sort of critically sore all the time, that you're probably spending a bit too much resource on recovery and concomitantly less on adaptation. So I think that, you know, um, my soreness guidelines for myself have been, you um, uh, know, part of this is the going lower towards MEV is like, uh, you know, almost ideal soreness is uh, so granted that your performance is consistently, you know, improving or stable. Ideal soreness is somewhere between getting a little bit sore and getting sore enough to be for sure healed before your next training session for that body part. Not like still, you know, still a little crisp, like, Ooh, like, yeah. and then like by the third set, you don't feel it, but the first set you do, I think consistently training like that with that much soreness just means you're doing more damage than is, uh, than is productive for the overall uh, adaptive response. So I've just been staying shy of really crazy mega soreness and I think I've been getting better results. The funny thing is, is that for, for a while, I was really pushing the soreness in the other direction, like radical soreness. And um, I was actually experiencing some real difficulties recovering, particularly my quadriceps. It's just so easy to make your quads so sore that you can't move for a week. Like, just literally enough leg press reps and then squats after will do that. Like, you can just cook your quads and then just, you know, afterburn them with squats and you just won't walk. But it, I did that for months in a row, and it was like, yeah. And then I, a, a couple of years ago, I did a mesocycle where I trained heavy, but I didn't get super sore, just a little sore. I just made these real impressive gains, not just in strength, but in visible size. And I was like, something's weird. I don't know. And I tried it again, and I tried it again, both ways. And, I, you know, getting super crazy sore definitely has its place in, like, a last microcycle, but all the time, I think it's just a bit too much. So those are some of the things I've been doing differently uh, lately. And um, I think they make sense in a grand scheme. A lot of them always made sense. Just too pig headed to do it. You know what I mean? Like, but ah, fuck, I just want to blast my quads. Like, just shut up and follow the science. And Sure enough, it's working. So. I love actually I think um, not only I love hearing that but I think the audience will love hearing it and hearing how open-minded you are because that's something I actually love and I, hopefully I feel like I've helped get some of you smart guys together allow oh, you to hear each other's perspectives and then that builds on each other because I've heard Eric's spoken about how he's taken on board some of your practices of like set increases where people hadn't thought about that perspective before. So it's definitely something I do and kind of why I love running the podcast and talking to all of you guys is taking everything from you and kind of seeing what fits and what works best. And yeah, it's great to see that we, we're almost, we don't want to get dogmatic obviously, but everyone's kind of moving sort of in the same direction with their methods and principles and things, which is actually makes life easier for a lot of people. Yeah. Easier. Well, the reason we're moving in the same direction is because we're being open-minded enough to see the validity in other people's ideas and uh you know no one's moving in the direction or at least most people aren't just by being yes man and just doing something you know like uh you know the way i got folks to sort of get a little bit used to the volume concepts wasn't like we published them and they were like yeah this is great let's just religiously follow it most people were like i don't know and james and i spent two years explaining them painstakingly on 50 podcasts and 10 <laughs> books and shit and nowadays, people are like, you just use the terms kind of like, oh, MEV. And people will be like, well, what's that? And they'll just explain it in a real common way. It's like, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. Like, well, yeah, it basically does. So a lot of stuff makes a lot of sense. And I think the worst kind of attitudes we could have, one is just an attitude of, well, fuck what everyone else thinks. I'm just a genius and I'll just do things myself. Um, and another one is an attitude of, you know, uh, I know I do this thing and I have no idea really why it's a good idea, but, but this is definitely the thing. 
Um, and, and when you're forced to defend it, you can't. This has recently been uh, pretty, pretty well on display with um, folks that are still holding on to the idea that uh, uh, altering your that uh, it just depends on which which idea you're talking about. They're related cluster of ideas. One of them is that volume is the predominant influencer of hypertrophy versus intensity. And there's a variety of ways to say that, yeah. which makes more and less sense. But some people just hang on to this idea, like, look, if you just get stronger for reps, like, that's all that matters. And it's like, yeah, that's definitely true. As far as it goes, it doesn't go far enough. Uh, and you could put it another way, saying, like, if the weight's heavy enough, what, the only thing that matters after is, like, can you do more volume with it and recover? Because if the answer is yes, you'll get bigger. And then someone could be like, well, what's really the most important thing for hypertrophy? Is it volume or intensity? Well, you know, you could say, like, your, here's your MEV and your MRV. If you're between those two and you make intensity jumps, intensity is more important. But if you have an intensity range, 30% to, you know, 85% of your one RM, and you make volume jumps through those, same thing, right? But uh, it, a lot of people just really been rejecting the volume side, even though there are folks doing the research, Brad Schoenfeld, for example, who've made very unequivocal statements like volume is the primary driver of growth. And those statements can be taken out of context and bastardized, but there's some real truth to that, that even the intensity crowd could really appreciate. I mean, the ultimate example being, if your intensity is the most important thing, why not do 1RMs over and over to try to get bigger? Then, uh, you know, all sorts of cleverness instead of wisdom starts. Well, technically, it's like, yeah, so you have to do volume to grow. Like, yes, okay, but it's got to be heavy. Like, well, you know, these 30% studies with Brad and a bunch of other people seem to show growth. A lot of bodybuilders train with, you know, metabolite kind of training, and they get real big, and it seems just awkward. It is Nobody in bodybuilding trains one rms all the time, you know, uh, even powerlifters don't. Like, it, it's curious. When powerlifters have to grow muscle, they do 10s and 8s begrudgingly, you know. Yep. They hate them. They still do them. So it's one of those things, like, you know, if you're really open-minded, some stuff sneaks up on you, and you're like, man, I guess we just kind of have to accept this tentatively as currently the best idea. It's just never a good idea to be like, no, that's bullshit. It, in your own head, you can't even explain to yourself why you think that's the case. That no, is dog. No, exactly. I think that's completely true. And I think it's it's crazy how actually it's developed more so into the training side because everyone was so used to it being in the nutrition side with these keto diets and all these different approaches. And now it's coming to the training side, whereas that was just because we're learning more about it. And I guess that's given opportunity for all these discussions to come out. Yeah. What I really like so far, actually – some a recent development is uh, Greg Knuckles did the reviews on strength and hypertrophy um, on his site, which is phenomenal, just phenomenal work. And if, I think uh, James Krieger did an independent review on hypertrophy and uh, frequency, um, uh, you know, uh, it came to a similar but slightly different conclusions. And what's really good this time uh, is maybe, maybe it's just a perception, a random chance, uh, maybe it's Greg's audience is different, but usually when things would come out like this, people do the TLDR, read the abstract, and then I get a thousand Instagram questions at every post like, hey, so why aren't you training five times a week like Greg Knuckles says, right? I've been getting pretty much none of that because I think me and Greg did such a good job writing the articles that are like mostly caveats and just a little bit of the article is what he actually found. Uh, I mean, I'm just kidding, but it's a lot of explanation, Right. Um, uh, but it's, it was, I think people are getting a little bit more savvy, uh, that, and I think Greg Knuckles has a pretty select audience of yeah. just people who are savvy to begin with. Um, and they don't fall for like, you know, he also didn't sell it like high frequency is the thing to do, or you're dumb. He's like, here's the frequency review. There's some cool take home points, but be really careful about this, that X, Y, Z. So I think it's a good, a good trend. And hopefully on average over the years, this kind of trend will continue. So. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think I, I made a post recently saying is, are we making people more neurotic and confused? Or are we helping by having all this information out there? And I think overall, it is definitely helpful. It just becomes unhelpful when people are 
looking for the black and white answer. And then when there are people providing that dogmatic black and white answer, that isn't necessarily the case. Yeah. Greg Knuckles is not the place to go for yeah. black and white answers. He'll be the first to tell you that neither are we and neither are you. And, um, you know, there are no black and white answers in evidence-based fitness. There are very distinct shades of gray to where you could be like, you know, on average, this is a real good place to start. Right. Uh, a lot of people like send me, uh, like uh, some an idea about programming they have or ask me on Instagram or something in the comments. And a lot of times what I'll say is, you don't have to get in a real lengthy discussion about how, well, you know, here's the trade-offs of this, the, the caveats, costs, benefits. Here's a, the grander scheme. And I would need to know 50 times more things about you as an individual to really guide you. But what I usually like to say is, you know, that, that seems fundamentally sound. It looks like a fine idea. Give it some thought, try it, be very wary of what happens, uh, really take notes, uh, see how your body responds, and go from there. And I think that's, we can definitely, because, you know, a lot of times people, I really don't want to portray evidence-based fitness as the it depends mean, you know, man, this couple years ago, this was bad. Some bodybuilders especially got into like, people would ask them an expert questions and he'd be like, it depends. He'd be like, okay, that that's it. And and people come on, they'd be like, depends on what? He'd be like, it just depends, bro, on a lot of stuff. You know, it's like, yeah, I understand you don't give advice for free and you do consults. I sure hope you don't do it depends on consults, right? It depends on what? Well, like, you know, there's – you definitely can't, you know, zoom in and give super grainy, granular advice to everyone. But if you're looking out over a landscape and there's a huge hill and a lake, you know, you are not expected to tell people exactly how many trees there are in that picture, but you can be like, look, there's a big hill and a lake. Don't get tired climbing up the hill and don't drown swimming in the lake. That's all I got to tell you. Bring a swim, swim trunks and hiking boots because that's what's going to be happening, right? Um, so when people say like, what, you know, hey, what's in this picture? You're not going to be like, depends on who's looking. It fucking doesn't depend. It's a fucking hill and a lake, right? Now, if someone's like, how many trees are there? And you're like, well, it depends on what you call a tree. Are we talking about like uh, what kinds of, you know, plants are classified as trees, but full grown trees, are, you know what I mean? Yeah. Are we talking about like which part of the frame? Is it the entire national park? You know, all this other stuff. That's for private consults. But I think some people in evidence-based fitness get carried away with this idea of like, it's all context specific. Like that's another thing that fucking drives me insane. Like, Context is, uh, what does it say? Like, context, context is, is the key. most important thing. Context, context. And it's like, yeah, there are general rules in average contexts. You know, uh, back in the day, I got into a discussion, which went pretty well, but people were saying there's no such thing as a healthy and unhealthy food. And I was like, yeah, you know, if you count aliens, there's no such thing as foods and non foods, because there's probably aliens on planet Zeta 9 that eat fucking metal scraps and they think that's food. So when you ask, like, what's food, you'd be like, well, for aliens, it could be nothing. You could eat nothing and still be eating food. Jesus Christ, we can't generalize anything then, right? So it would be like, okay, you know, who are we really talking about here? The modern Western population in relatively urban areas. And, and there we can make paint with these averages. Yes, they're on average, junk food yeah. can be very well defined. Now, are there exceptions? Of course. There's no rule to which there aren't exceptions. It's like asking somebody like, so like, uh, is that a truck or a car? And you're like, well, it depends. You know, context is key. Like, yeah, you know, there's like that weird thing. People like, fucking um, Bogan's drive in Australia, which is like the fucking, uh, fucking half car, half truck thingy. Oh, yeah. um, you know what I mean? But but other than that, like it's usually like there's definitely a gray area, even for such a simple concept. But there's definitely like a lot more solid gray and very, very light gray of like this is a fucking car and this is a fucking truck. So, you know, if someone asks an automotive expert, like, is this a car or a truck? If they say like, well, it depends, like, get the, the fuck out of here. Get the fuck out of here. Just be like, yeah, it's you see a car. Now, you know, if you want to ask me a more technical question, I can sure as hell answer it. So I think uh, super long rant here. Here's the point of that rant. When you discover that you're in evidence-based fitness, try to make the advice you give to people both simple and fundamentally true, which requires the abandonment of absolute terms. You can say on average, mostly in many cases, in most cases, it's helpful to begin with qualifier terms like that, that give people a feel that the world isn't confusing. They don't have to be neurotic. It doesn't just all depend. Here's a place to start. And then if people need help navigating after they've started, 
you, there's a wealth of literature on all the factors on which it depends. And if you don't want to fucking bother with those factors, just hire a coach and then nothing depends. Just do what the coach says. Right. So I think it's just, it's that ultimate, you know, it's the swinging pendulum. Like you talk about those in fitness. I think it's a uh, pendulum went from like, in Instagram meme is advice <laughs> yep. to like everything depends. Everything is context. It's like mm, it's somewhere between those two is usually a good idea. No, I think it, it's a, definitely a good run. And I have to say, I think since I got more introduced to seeing your writing, seeing how you talk, Mike, I've actually started, I, I implement those qualifiers all the time and they literally save my ass every time I do them. I'm like, I love these. These just like, are so Aren't they great. <laughs> It's not just that they save you from pedantic pieces of shit being like, well, it's technically not always the case. You're like, fuck, I knew that. <laughs> right. But it's also the real way to communicate about the structure of how the world actually works. The world works in averages and normal distributions. There, you know, uh, it's very difficult to get exact answers out of the universe, arguably impossible, but there are degrees of precision there are valuable degrees of precision, right? Uh, it doesn't all depend. Like, you know, some questions have, especially in, in a certain context, of very pretty definite fucking answers. Imagine, and I think a lot of people lose sight of this, talking about really sort of esoteric things and hobbies like exercise. Imagine if your mechanic used terms like, you know, it depends excessively. Uh, imagine if your doctor did that, you know, like, so what are you going to do about the tumor? Like, well, it depends. Well, God damn it. You better do something about it. Right. They, these drugs don't work on it. Depends. They just fucking work. You know, like if you got cancer, they got things for you that really actually do stuff. So, um, you know, and of course they don't work for it, you know, depending on what kind of cancer you have, they can't use all the drugs. Maybe if you're already sick, they have to use radiation only so on and so forth. But those are all navigable ways and there's structure there as a person of wisdom as a person uh, who really knows, um, like, you know, knows things and people pay them to know things, you have to know when to stop saying it depends and start saying what it depends on or give nuggets that are general enough for people to start somewhere. Like, um, you know, people say, like, eat, eat more uh, or eat less and move more is not good advice. Like, yeah, yeah, for obese people, it's not because that's just a very, a very low reach level of advice. They need more help. But to get a, a you know a first day understanding of what the fundamental cause of obesity is, that's it, right? If you don't know that, you're real shit out of luck for understanding anything super complicated. All the other questions are answering more or less like, how do we get people to do those two things? You know what I mean? So we got to play that fine line of qualifier terms slash enough meaning to actually convey something because if it's all qualifiers we end up not saying a whole lot of anything yeah and then it just becomes a little bit lazy really i think 100 percent. that's the number one. i'm really glad you said that people like it looks like far intellectualism you know they're like well technically i'm such an expert that i would bore you to tears if i told you all this <laughs> well how about you be a real expert and tell me like how averages work you know where i picked this up was um uh through a lot of the reading i do on economics just for fun um, and uh, economists have learned to talk like this for years because they almost invented the concept of trade-offs in the formal sense. And a lot of the things they say is like, you know, economists will say, you know, markets usually work well to organize societies and make them productive. That's not the same thing as saying markets work well every single time. That's not the same thing to say the government doesn't have important roles, but it just worked better on average. Now, if you say, now, what about in this case? And then they can look to that actual case but if you're trying to just vote and you don't really know a whole lot and there's like five ballots and, you know, they're all anti-market, you should probably vote against them on average if you don't know much. And if you know more, then you can make a more informed decision. Another thing is interesting in intellectual life is degrees of information behind your decisions. But the thing is, decisions have to be made anyway. If you're waiting for perfect information to make decisions, you'll wait forever. Mm -hmm. You have to use the best information that is available to you at the time. Now, some decisions can be delayed. But a lot of decisions have to be made. Like, for example, what am I going to do? Am I going to squat or am I going to leg press in my program? You know, man, if you're a first-time exerciser or a first-time thinker about exercise, you start Googling squat versus leg press, oh, no. oh, my God. You go down a wormhole, right? 
But fundamentally, you still, you say, like, I don't really know. I've been researching. I can't decide yet which one I want to use. Motherfucker, it's Thursday. It's leg day. You better pick one of them shits. So if you read four or five articles and you're starting to get an impression that for most people, squats cover more bases and less time, you may not be 100% certain on another lot of things, but that's good enough to throw the dice somewhere. The thing is, all of us experts or whatever, we throw the dice too. We just have more information behind the dice. It's not an infinite amount of information. Yeah. Everything is an educated guess. Some guesses are just really educated. But whatever education you have, you got to make a guess anyway. So a lot of the paralysis by analysis and what did you describe it, like an increase in anxiety with new yeah. stuff coming out, that's just from trying to delay the decision. Make the decision using the best information you have available to you at the time. Guess what? If it turns out it was the wrong decision, you come back and you're like, damn it, I shouldn't have picked that. Now, hold on a sec. What did you do when you picked it? You picked it based on the best information you had at the time. Well, geez, that, that, that's, if you came back in a time machine, that's what you would have done anyway. You know what I mean? Like, all you could do is the best at the time. And I think, uh, boy, have I given that advice a lot out to you know some people who's – whose IQ is like, you know, a lot higher than their, their lean mass sort of mm-hmm. thing. Uh, and people just like, well, it's all these variables and exercise. It's like, put together a program you think doesn't suck. Start doing it. And then you start getting a huge stream of data that corrects the program. Uh, but a lot of people just won't even write a program because like, I just don't know enough. Yeah. It's like, look, there's people working out that don't know how to write for fuck's sake. Yeah. I swear to God, half the bros in my gym can't fucking read or write. So, and they do just fine, right? So it's one of those like, know what you know. It doesn't all depend. Start in a decent place and then slowly keep learning to make it better. That's all we're doing. Yeah, no, I, I think I absolutely agree. I think I've, I've got clients who are probably more intelligent than me, but it's a case of they're too intelligent and I have to save them from themselves and just be like, right, we've got a, a system. It's iterative, iterative. Iterative, is that right? I've gone iterative. Yes. Iterative. <laughs> yep. um, so showing my intelligence and then we just go base it off that and move forward. So um, yeah, I That's think it. I completely agree. Yeah. Awesome. So we, we will get to some questions and we won't have just it depends answers. Uh, and we will start off with uh, the Patreon supporters of the podcast. So we really support uh, you guys or thank you for your support rather. And the first question is from Andrew Podzak. I'm going to have to ask him to actually tell me how to spell his, uh, to say his name because he is a client of mine. Uh, and he has asked, um, exercise selection based on your muscles, mind, uh, muscle, mind connection, not be- based on exercises that are best for the muscles. How important is it that an exercise feels better for you and your muscles versus being quote unquote, a better exercise. So I guess this might be something like, I don't know, high bar squats are said to be, one of the best quad builders, but you feel a lunge better in your quads, which one would you think is more important? How do we weigh that up as a trainee? Um, that's really good. Really good question. A little bit of that um, depends on where we make our cutoffs. Depends uh, where we make our cutoffs for what we consider um a sufficient level of mind muscle connection. Um, and don't worry, I'll answer the depends. The, the good place to make that cutoff is can you feel the muscle working? Does the muscle experience delayed onset soreness through that exercise without a ton of joint stress and other muscles getting work too much? Um, like needlessly, you know what I mean? Like, I don't mean like your glutes get sore from squats. I mean, like your upper back gets sore from squats more than your quads, you know? Um, and are they getting a pump from training? And, uh, you know, is that happening to the target muscle without any uh, hindrance to your overall fatigue or joint pain or stress or just a totally other muscle taking clearly all most of the load? If you can answer yes to all of those, that is enough mind-muscle connection, so to speak, enough evidence of targeting and disruption of the muscles uh, that it can be considered a good exercise and can very well be included. Um, now, if we have an exercise and we have two of those exercises, the same feel on both of those or the same uh, disruption to both, and, but one exercise you just feel it feels better for you, the mind-muscle connection is better, definitely choose the one with more mind-muscle, but be careful falling too deep into the mind-muscle connection at the expense of volume, at the expense of intensity, and really, to be honest, at the expense of 
uh, compound basics versus very, very limited isolation moves. For example, you might not feel your biceps as much in a barbell curl. You might feel them more in a cable, like one arm behind the back curl or something. But that latter option so much degrades how much stress you're putting on the muscle that the feel of it doesn't seem to outweigh the lack of disruption and the lack of stimulus. For example, the way to feel the muscle the most is actually to just pose. <laughs> like posing literally is the best way to feel muscles, but there's nothing that beats hitting a most muscular for your chest. I mean, you're exactly feeling your chest. Front double biceps, you feel your biceps more than you ever will. You don't get big fucking posing, right? So as soon as you impose any kind of resistance on a muscle, you automatically start feeling that muscle a little less, especially as that resistance grows into, you know, 50, 60, 70% plus of one rep max. We know a lot of really good strength and uh, size gains happen there. So it's one of those things like if you have an exercise that you don't feel basically at all in your muscle – and it's not getting the muscle pumped, it's not getting the muscle sore, it's not making you progress, and it's fucking up the rest of your body, fuck that, don't do that shit. On the other hand, if you have an exercise that you feel, it's just really great feel, um, like some kind of one-leg hamstring curl thing, and like you're like, oh my God, I'm just, oh, I just like fucking, I'm in my hamstrings right now, like I'm Neo in this shit. But like, you've done like 12 sets per workout, three days a week, and you've never experienced DOMS, they can't really tell if it ever gets a pump. Uh, and if for sure, like, if someone's like, so was that hard? You're like, no, I'm just fucking off. Um, I mean, it's clearly not a workout. Anything between those two extremes, pick the exercises that you like the most. And if you have a tie, pick the more barbell, more compound, heavy basic stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's it. So there's a big gray area, gray area, uh, effective range. Where there's a mix, just avoid the extremes of like, I got to squat. They're like, how do squats feel like? I'm just breaking my back. You're like, stop squatting. Or another thing, so, so that's the big part of the answer, right? The second part of the answer is it's not a static equation. You can improve your execution of exercises to feel them more. A lot of people say, uh, have told me in the past, you know, I don't feel high bar squats in my quads. I finally see them in real life. After five minutes of working on their technique, they're like, oh, my God, what the fuck? And I was like, yeah, you've been doing these like a power lifter, which is great. That's why you're so strong. But if you want bigger quads, you're going to have to change how you do them. You know, sitting into your knees more, staying super upright, uh, heels, Olympic shoes, so on and so forth. So um, a lot of times when people tell me and they're like one to three years of lifting, they're like, I don't feel this exercise. I'm like, man, eh, that doesn't tell me much. And that's not to say I'll say keep doing it. I'll say true. Do other exercises as your main movements. Put this one on the back burner and try to alter your technique so that you feel it more. Play around. Hopefully, if you have a coach, that's much more productive time. Um, but if someone's been training for like 10 years and their squat technique or whatever is perfect, and they're like, dude, this just does not do shit for me. And when I do leg presses, it fries me. I'm just like, leg press away. Yeah, I have to agree. The experience thing's huge because I think at, when you're just getting started, I don't. I think a lot of people aren't even aware of what muscles totally. are, like. They know it's working the chest, but they're not really thinking about it at all. They're just doing the totally. motion. Um, totally. I've had clients like less than a year of training experience. You do like bench presses with them, and they're like, "Ow!" And then you do like some chest machine, and they're like, "I really feel that." I'm just like. I don't say anything, but I'm just like, shut the fuck up. I don't give a shit what you feel. Your feelings are inaccurate. <laughs> right? I wouldn't trust you to feel your way through a fucking plastic bag. So now two years, three years, 10 years later, like if Jared Feather, my, one of my training partners, looks at me and he's like, dude, I don't feel these at all. I'm like, why the fuck are we doing them then, right? But it, it, it's definitely a difference. And actually, I don't know if just to side tangent slightly, if this relates at all to um, someone posted in our Revive Stronger group on Facebook about different stances for squats. So like sumo stance, um, feet forward, uh, narrower stance, and then like cannonball squats. And this was to target different areas of the quads. And they're, like, um, they're like, do you know Tom Platts, how he used to squat kind of like heels almost together? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Out. So sure. super close. Um, sure. And he was like, is there any science to back this up? And I think you may have even spoken about this at the seminar where um, kind of the research doesn't always align with a lot of what we see with people. Well, the research on squat stance is usually done on people who are either trained, which means one to three years of lifting on average, 
or uh, untrained, which means they've never touched a weight. And they're just, it's just really unreliable what muscles are active, what's not. A lot of it's just like a desperate fight for survival and everything's maximally active. Um, so if you get, you know, there's not a lot of test studies done on trained lifters about differential activation. Um, so there's definitely, but it's one of those things like when you're a trained lifter, you can tell real soon. Here's a real easy trick. Just do a lot of volume on that. Work up to a lot of volume. See what's getting sore. This is going to tell you real easily what's getting worked the most, you know? Like if you do really wide stance squats and someone tells you like, oh, well, it's just as much quads and not much of anything else as narrow stance and you're like your adductors get sore, your glutes get sore, but your quads don't get sore, like they can tell you whatever the fuck they want. It's just not yeah. true. Another easy one is like if you have an injured quad, but you can still sumo squat, like clearly it's not working your quads a lot. That was one of those. I remember Paul Carter and myself were on the same side of the bench press lats versus chest debate. Like are lats a prime mover in the bench and is chest important. And Paul was like, do you assholes ever see a fucking lat tear benching? No. <laughs> Why would you see a pec tear if it clearly wasn't involved as a major force? But how the fuck does that work, right? So a lot of people say like, yeah, quads, you know, get hit no matter how you squat. They'll hurt their quad and they'll start sumo squatting. Like, I don't feel it this way. Like, there's a reason you don't feel it. Yeah. The force transduction is not the same. Uh, now, on the other hand, um, you know, some people might widen their stance and squats and they're still box their quads up and not a lot of those getting sore. Great. Still a quad emphasis movement. So a lot of, man, I tell you what, a lot of the, uh, that's probably in hypertrophy. I have many areas in which I feel very confident of my knowledge. That's not one of them, man. I honestly just don't give a shit. People are like, what exercise can I do to work on my this and that part? I'm like, shut the fuck up. All of them, dude. Work through a variety of ranges of, or ranges of motion, through a variety of planes of motion, different kinds of contractions, uh, especially complex muscles like the back. Like you should be doing some kind of rows and some kind of pull downs, probably many kinds of rows and pull downs. When you do that, your whole fucking back is going to grow. Like you look at, you know, Nicholas Vuillard or however you say his name, look at his back and look at your back. What part do you think of your back is bigger? Get the fuck out of here. You need a fucking new back, <laughs> right? Like I, I just, so, and, 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 and you look at the data on all the stuff and it's like the, the difference in activation may be so small. And here's another thing. Do you want to go on group differences and averages? Cause remember, Body mechanics, uh, neurological interfaces, all the stuff can mean that two people get different activation in different parts of their exercises from the same technique. So what does it come down to? What are you feeling in the fucking exercise? Yeah. Here's a real good self-solving problem. We can say, but hold on, beginners don't feel anything like they're bad at assessing what they feel. Good. They don't need to specify anyway because you're just fucking training. You just you need any muscle at all before you're shaping clay. You're just slapping clay on. Once you get five years plus training experience and you start to want to target certain areas, you're also mind muscle connected enough at that point to really know what's working what. It's that simple. Yeah. So, no, I, a lot I of evidence based training isn't going to studies. It's knowing that some studies are just very limited and going to experience through rational, reasoned uh, approach. I think this is one of the areas where bodybuilding versus something like powerlifting, there's so much individualization. Like that's no, not normally a huge thing, but in bodybuilding, I think when this mind muscle connection comes in and different an anatomies and that sort of thing, it is a bigger principle, I guess. Totally, absolutely. Perfect. Uh, we go on to the next question from Mike Saad, and uh, he said, to what extent does heavy infrequent alcohol consumption, say once per month, affect hypertrophy goals long term? And how long does the acute reduction in testosterone levels as well as the MPS generally last for? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. While you're drunk and while you're hungover is the answer to the second part of the question. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Large but infrequent. That could be two days or three days or some shit total. <laughs> the answer to the first part of the question is a very insignificant amount. I wouldn't worry about it at all. Unless you get hurt when you're doing dumb shit when you're drunk. And I have to say that because there's a huge intersection of the people that do binge drinking every once a month and the people that get hurt doing dumb shit. So don't try to do box jumps on the fucking... Uh, you know, garbage cans. Uh, don't try to arm wrestle people at parties. Every time you're jacked, you go to parties. <laughs> someone's like, let's arm wrestle. I've actually hurt myself every single time I've arm wrestled anyone, uh, I believe, in the last uh, 20, 15 years. So I just like, have rejected every arm wrestle request ever. 
since then. Uh, you know, it's also like you're not at a party to arm wrestle. I'm fucking idiots. You're there to... I don't even know why. I, don't, I haven't been to a party in years. I don't know why the fuck people go. Oh, no, Jared and I went to a party last weekend. We brought Diet Coke and yeah. <laughs> books and milk. So we only stayed for like two hours, and then we took some people from the party and went to go eat at a diner because <laughs> we had another meal. That's that's how we party. But, um, yeah, you know, you're there to socialize and stuff like that and not there for, like, egotistical chauvinism. Uh, so don't do dumb shit. Don't do dumb shit. And then, uh, you know, if you if you have, you know, 10, 10 beers every, uh, you know, third weekend or something, it's a drop in the bucket. Especially if you, um, you know, eat during that time, like finish the party with a trip to go some fast food instead of uh, instead of just going to sleep. Um, they, you know, a lot of your crowd is in Europe, like music festivals are super fun. Uh but don't disappear for three days on ecstasy and not sleeping and not eating anything, especially the not eating, you will lose kilos of muscle, kilos. Uh, you'll gain most of it back or all of it, really. It'll just take some time. And if it takes you a week to gain back, that's a pissed away week, right? So go to the music festivals, take all the fun drugs you want, just have some protein shakes and bars stored up with you so you can have, you know, every five hours, drop a couple of those back. It's a great experience. Yeah, I've had, like you said, actually, a lot of um, clients who have gone to these sort of festivals and things, and it is always a case of just take some whey protein with you, take some protein bars, take some beef jerky, you're fine, you'll be all right, you'll feel like crap for a couple of days, and we'll be good once you can get back into the kind of routine of things. Yeah, funny enough, uh, I was uh, taking uh, mushrooms with some friends, and one of my friends, we went to a diner for no good reason. Or just like, it was a mistake to go there. It was end up being a really creepy place. When you're on mushrooms, creepy things are extra creepy. <laughs> um, but one of my friends, like, we ordered food. And for a while, we just stared at it. Because you just forget <laughs> why people eat food altogether. And one of my friends, like, took a bite of his food. He's like, I want to taste it. He was like, that tastes great. And he chewed it. And he just held it in his mouth. And I was like, you're going to swallow? He's like, right, right. Like, <laughs> do I have to? He's like, can I just spit it out? Like, I'm done tasting it. It's like hilarious experience. So sometimes a protein bar on uh, on fun drugs is just a weird thing to have happen, but it's got to happen. So it's, you know, that's when you face. Set an alarm in your phone, protein bar. You're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> What's that? Eat it, and then you're on, well on your way. It's just just tiny little. So, I'm going to have to come out to Philadelphia and try some of these mushrooms because well, I'm so ignorant to all of these things as we discussed when you came over in, uh, about a month ago now. Yeah, It's, um, it's really, really fun. Uh, <laughs> it's funny that a European would come to the United States to do mushrooms. Like there's, Europe's the, the, the high seat, the capital of this kind of stuff. Yeah, I can probably get them. I just have no idea how. So, uh, <laughs> That's probably for I'm the gonna best. Get, I'm going to get a load of email contacts now from everyone who's watching, but um, I'm yeah. probably <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think mushrooms are probably legal in the UK or just not, they're not criminally punished. They're illegal in the United States, but it's one of those things like nobody, get, like there's no DEA task force for mushrooms as far as I can tell. Or like these fucking dopers and nobody cares. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, but anyway, uh, it's just, you know, whatever part of partying you do, eat still reasonably ish. Don't do anything stupid like getting yourself hurt. I know a lot of people that have gotten hurt almost never through fighting, just dumb shit, like jumping onto stuff and off of stuff. Yeah. A lot of people don't do it. Just, just relax and have fun like everybody else. And actually, I guess, is it, I don't know if we, we want to delve into the mushroom thing. Is there a reason it is that's what you like? Does that not impact training performance? How does that go for you, Mike? Yeah. So I, I do it very rarely, maybe like uh, twice a year or something oh, like wow, that. Okay. Um, at most, I mean, yeah, yeah, twice a year. And, uh, it's a six hour high. And after that, the, there is the opposite of a hangover. You actually feel better after mushrooms than before. And there's really good data to show that you're psychologically better off for months. Um, so, you know, people say like, oh, after drinking, I'm racked after mushrooms. You're like, the calmest, most logical person you've ever been. Um, during, you are none, none, none of those things. Um, but it's also like, so mushrooms is basically a mild case of food poisoning. So you can't eat during a lot. Most people can't. Um, so you eat like a good meal a couple hours before, let your stomach clean out a little bit. And then you take them and you uh, have a lot of fun. And then, you know, maybe four hours, you start sip a protein shake or have a little snack. And then 
relax and shower and then have a real meal and food tastes good again. And that's it. One of the reasons I do them is because drinking uh, just started to be all the negatives and none of the positives for me. Like I just, I get hung over during drinking and I'm like, fuck that. And like drinking, um, I used to drink in college to be more socially apt uh, because I had confidence issues, but now I have the opposite of that. So I'm like, not uh, I can if I can come up to random people in the street and start a conversation, no problem about anything. You tell me, just talk to that guy about that. Like, Excuse me, sir. Uh, <laughs> so I don't need alcohol for that. Um, and uh, you know, the a couple of times back in the day that I tried mushrooms, um, it's the kind of drug that like the drug education videos tell you about. Like reality changes significantly. Um, and it's super, super fun. Um, so it's not like, like with drinking, if you've drank enough, you're just kind of like, I feel like shit. Just give me the fuck out of here. Um, with mushrooms, it's like, it's really, really mind all shit. Doesn't look the same. It doesn't feel the same. You sort of feel like you're four years old, kind of like the kind of wonder, like you look at a cloud and be like, it's like a religious experience all the time. Uh, and then after you're done, it's it's really um, it's psychologically beneficial. Um, no one's ever been addicted to mushrooms. I can't imagine that. As soon as you've done them, you're not like let's do more. <laughs> you're like, thank God, I have sanity back again. <laughs> like so, it's one of those. And as far as it's actually been tested and ranked on like a harm to society, harm to the self index, it scores so low. It's like below caffeine. You know, like. Uh, you know, harm to society for mushrooms is basically impossible because most people are so scared of other human beings. They don't even leave the house. Um, I've definitely done mushrooms at like art museums and stuff like that, which by the way is the only way to get me to go to an art museum uh, <laughs> and, and amazing. Uh, so it's one of those, like it, uh, it doesn't really, inter- it, it's just like zero missed meals. Basically um, the next day there's nothing recovery wise. Uh, there's no central fatigue or anything. So like if I do them on a Sunday with friends, Monday, it's back to work, back to uh, training, like nothing ever happened Uh, better than the nothing ever happened. So it's definitely, it's not like, yo, I just picked up a cocaine habit. Like Jesus Christ. (laughs) Uh, It's it's not remotely like the partying most people do and mushrooms are best done during the day. So it doesn't even interfere with your sleep. I was going to say, I'm not actually at all surprised with your answer. <laughs> um, I was kind of hoping that I might have caught you out where there's somewhere where you've slipped up and you just do have this awful habit. But actually, I'm glad that you answered yeah. the way you did. It's funny because mushrooms are like, it's um, it's a serious drug. Like it, um, the trips can go south on you and they take some thought and some intentions. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of a burden to, to trip. It, you don't fall back in it. You don't have like a, a moment of weakness. You have a moment of weakness and you drink, right? You don't have a moment of weakness to take mushrooms. You need strength to take mushrooms. Like we'll mix all the shit together. Like you drink it in tea basically. And we'll like, just our friends will stand there and be like, <laughs> okay, you guys ready? You're like, oh, okay, I guess like you, it takes like planning, you know, that's just some shit you do. So yeah, it's not a, it's funny that you call that it's like a habit. It's like anything is a remotely yeah. habit. It's like, you got to like will yourself to do it. I have friends that don't even do mushrooms anymore because they're like, fuck, it's too much work. <laughs> like that to put that in perspective. So. Perfect. All right, right. We'll get on to the next question and leave that Let's one do it. now. <laughs> um, so Justin Milowski has asked, um, I'm considering adding some forearm isolation movements for hypertrophy and aesthetic gains bra. Um, how would he suggest programming as to minimize the impact on the upper body training? So, yeah, it's a really great question. I'm, I'm, uh, Jared and I are really exploring forearm training right now with ourselves and some of our clients. And um, we're going to be uh, probably pushing forward a forearm recommendation formally on the website and everything. And this is one of the ones we don't have. By the way, I'm never making a neck hypertrophy guide so you guys can go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Just kidding. People keep asking me about neck. Like, do you want sleep apnea or something? For fuck's sake. Stop trying to train your neck. If you're a grappler, that might be an exception, but maybe I'll make a grappling neck training guide or some shit. Um, forearms. Really good question. What you definitely want to do is figure out the days of the week. It's really quite easy on which you have to rely on your forearm strength in other muscle groups. And then you take your workouts for forearms and you put them just after those so that you get the maximum amount of time to recover for the next time. So for example, let's say you have pull, push, legs, repeat. 
your forearm workout will be sometime pretty close to after pull. Definitely not before. But if you do pull, forearms, maybe on your push day, then you have the whole leg day to rest, then pull again. It doesn't interfere with your, with your pull training. <clears throat> that being said, if you're purely doing physique purposes, using straps intelligently can make it that it's okay to be a little bit messed up with your forearms and it's not going to cost you much. Um, but it's, it's, it's as easy as planning out your week, seeing what you rely with your forearms and just not putting any grip training before then. And then for forearm training, start with really low volumes twice a week forearm work, <clears throat> literally like three sets of wrist curls on Monday, three sets of wrist curls on Thursday. And then just for, for six months, just stick to those six sets and just get a little stronger. And then if you have a real good like eye on where you can recover and how, add another session. So three form workouts per week. Now you're up to nine sets. And then with three workouts per week, maybe that's kind of the most you can fit in logically without interfering with too much stuff. Then you start to increase the volume and figure out your MRV, and then you run MEV to MRV the rest of your life. So, so um, uh, really pretty straightforward, I think. Is there anything I, I missed as far as that answer? No, the only thing I'd be interested to hear about is obviously people might listen to that and think of just adding it on top of what they're already doing. Is that something they could do? Because obviously nothing comes for free. How does that impact like our kind of systemic MRV? Yeah, minimally, minimally because it's such a tiny muscle. Yeah. Um, Oh, tiny muscle mass. Um, it does impact it somewhat. Psychologically, it impacts it um, uh, quite a bit because it's just another fucking thing you have to do. You know, like um, the psychological burden of a high volume program, especially one that has long durations of training, really can catch up with you. Yeah. Um, and remember, fatigue is cumulative from all sources, including the psychological. Um, even if your gym plays music you absolutely hate and you don't have any headphones, it's actually going to cost you fatigue. Um, like hate, hate, you know, not just like whatever. Um, so it's one of those things like, you know, you could do like, you know, bench press, shoulder press, triceps, side delts, feeling fucking great. Get a pump, leave the gym. Life is good. Eat your meals, go to sleep, grow. Or you could do all that and look at your sheet or your, 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 your app and be like fucking forearm training. Uh, 20 minutes or 10 minutes, even, even five minutes. You're like, I just wish I wasn't here anymore. This is bullshit. And then training starts to feel burdensome as opposed to sweet. Cause you know, yeah. form training is just not that fun. It gets okay. This is not the greatest thing in the world. It's super easy, but it's that psychological stuff I'd worry about more, which is why I'm always curious when people lift like two to three times a week and they're like, I want to do forearms. I'm like, what the fucking barely train? <laughs> what are you talking about? You want you want a three hour workout each time? Nobody's going to fucking notice your forearms. There's a rest. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, why don't you just, 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 just do weights, and dips and shoulder presses and stuff. And when you get sort of a big ish, you can work on forearms. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. And I actually really glad you brought up the psychological component because Oftentimes, I mean, especially for myself, when I'm getting um, my tour days and they're taking over an hour each and then I'm at my overreaching week, I'm like, okay, part of the reason I'm looking forward to my deload is just so I can take some time not being at the gym all the time. Yep, absolutely. And, and then the same, I guess, most people are fortunate where I think a lot of people don't have to train their abs. Most people have to train calves, but these are two areas I definitely do need to train. And that, again, it does it is a burden. Totally. Abs, calves, traps, forearms. You just got to do them unless you don't have to do them. And if you don't have to do them, don't do them because you're going to fucking hate it. You're going to wonder why the fuck you were doing them to begin with. Don't let weird chasing of pointless optimality fuck up the rest of your program. I think that's a lot of things that people yeah. tend to forget the quest for optimality is, is a quest to, at some point, reduce how fun the program is. You've got to make sure you're, you know, because they're like, oh, I can get 1% more gains by, by upping my frequency to, like, six times a week. Do you really want to do that? No. How much does 1% matter to you? Are you stepping on stage at the Olympia? They're like, no, I just do this for fun. Like, for fun. Let's remember that. So some people just seem to just be like, oh, I want to add forms. You're like, why? They're like, I don't know. Like, well, if you don't clearly have an idea why you're doing it, don't do it. 
Yeah, I think that's really important because I think a lot of people, I think, I mean, and rightly so, the recommendations put out there quite frequently and like when people look at yourself, they look at Mike, uh, Jared even, and they look at me, maybe they think, oh, these guys are doing so much volume. They're really trying to like maximize their muscle growth. I feel like I should be doing this as well. And it's kind of like, well, like we are, but we have the ability to do that. You may not even have the ability and then you're putting a burden on yourself, not being able to achieve it. That's probably even more psychologically like like burning them out than anything as well. Yeah. People ask me in jujitsu all the time, you know, if I want to train, what should I be doing? I'm like two to four sessions a week of compound heavy basics that should take you 45 minutes per session. And they're like, that's it. I'm like, yeah. They're like, how much do you train? And I'm like 10 hours a week in the gym. And they're like, fuck, why? And I'm like, cause I'm a bodybuilder dude. And they're like, does it help you in jujitsu? I'm like, not at this point, <laughs> you know, like it just hurts. It's too much fatigue. I'm weirdly muscle bound. Can't do a bunch of moves. So, you know, you, you don't need to be, you know, fit for Mr. Olympia uh, you know, most people who want to look great, feel great, etc. cetera. Uh, this is actually a talk that uh, Berge Fagarelli and I had on um, Jacob uh, Skepis's podcast recently. Look, man, if you're a successful business person or getting your career started, you got a family, you got hobbies, three to four sessions of an hour, most hour and a half in the gym per week, you're getting fucking great results. You're going to look great. You're going to feel great. You're going to be jacked compared to regular people and a lot of gym bros, and it's going to be so worth the effort. You start getting into six sessions a week, uh, you know, two a days. Like unless you've got competitive plans, oh, serious? Don't do that shit. And then here's the thing. If you're considering competition later, just stick to the minimum, not minimum, stick to the stuff that works for a very small input until it's not giving you the results that you want anymore. And you can always do more, but that shit is always ahead of you. It's not like it's a fucking race to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's important to remember. Um, and then, it, likewise, if people do want more, then you can equally do it. It's just like people totally. end up thinking it's one or the other. Um, yeah. do you have time well, the worst more? thing is, when, oh. I do I have time. For, worst thing is when people want more, but they're unwilling to do the work. That yeah. shit just baffles the fuck out of me. They're like, well, I want to optimize, but I can only train three days a week. I'm get the fuck out of my face. What are you talking about? Like, well, I, I don't think you should be, I don't think you need to train six days a week to get the best growth. I'm like, right on. You should tell all bodybuilders that because these, these idiots are in the gym for way too long that apparently. So this is the last question. I'm not sure how long it would actually take you to answer. And um, it's from Andre Larson, and he has asked, what's your opinion on why CrossFitters look so damn jacked when not doing any real type of hypertrophy work? They do a lot of real hypertrophy work. They do, so the volumes of elite CrossFitters are so insane. Most people, if presented with them, um, unlabeled, so like, we're not telling you who trains like this, but here's what they do. They would be like, this is a joke. Nobody really does this. Our uh, RP videographer, we sent him over to Madison, Wisconsin for the CrossFit Games to videotape some of our uh, sponsored athletes. He was like, dude, I saw this girl do cleans and squats and like handstand walks for, I think, three hours. <laughs> and that was one workout of the day. Damn. She had two. And I was like, these are the best in the world for a reason, right? Here's the thing. It doesn't matter how you quantify training. Um, let, me, let me rephrase that. It doesn't matter how you uh, name training, right? What you name it, how you categorize it, volume is volume because of it just affects your body. So if a, a power lifter does 10 sets of eight and calls it pseudo sort of strength endurance work, yeah. they're going to grow. It's not up to them. If a sprinter does a bunch of stair sprints and uh, plyos and just track sprints, the hamstring and glute volume and quad volume, they're going to grow. It doesn't matter. They, they, they do no hypertrophy work, so to speak. But if you do enough workload under tension, you will grow. Crossfitters do so many front squats, so many snatches, so many handstand walks, so many push-ups. All of their shit is basically compound, full body, shoulder, hip, knee, elbow moving 
exercises. That's the whole fucking body. You would expect all their bodies to be fucking jacked, and they are. I mean, if we took a CrossFitter and we said, look, we're going to get you to look the same as you do now, but in the most efficient way possible, which means pure hypertrophy training, you could cut their volume by 70% and achieve an equal look. I mean, that's what figure competitors do. Figure competitors look better than CrossFitters, but train fucking at most half, you know, at most. And if, if you call cardio training and then it's like a third. How? Because everything they do is very specific. There's no skill work, none of that stuff. But the sheer amount of all the stuff CrossFitters do, and because it's compound heavy basics and stuff like that, that's how come they're jacked. Let, let's ask it for a real ridiculous muscle. Be like, how come CrossFitters have such big glutes? They don't do any glute training. What? They row. They do front squats, cleans, back squats, sumo. I mean, all they do is use their front glutes. <laughs> it, it, if they didn't have big glutes, it would be the biggest surprise in the world. <laughs> So just in sheer volume, CrossFitters uh, uh, respond uh, with hypertrophy. And also, it's included, they're so jacked. You know, the girls weigh like 135 pounds. Nobody's phoning in like jacked police. This is a jacked girl on camera. You see her in real life. Like um, I've met uh, Carrie Pierce. I don't know if you guys know who that is. Top five in the world. Top ten. Oh, wow. uh, one of our athletes. She's a former gymnast. And she, like in pictures, looked fucking ridiculous. And in real life, um, when she has uh, her like hoodie off and it's just sports bra, I'm like, fuck, girl, like biceps, triceps, delts, like the whole thing. She puts her hoodie on and I'm like, that is a tiny person who looks like she needs like an escort to the subway because she <laughs> looks like she's 15 years old. It looks like a, like a child, like a child sized person. But you're like, but she's fucking jacked. She weighs like 130 pounds. It's just not the big of her. She's like 5'2 or something. It's just this tiny thing. So people are like, they're so jacked. Like, mm, yeah, in real life, whatever. The guys, the CrossFit guys, you know, they're like 160 to 180, sometimes a little bigger. You know, like meter 80 up to meter 90, meter 70. Like, yeah, they're, they're unbelievable shape. You know. They're not bodybuilders. They're maybe incomplete men's physique competitors. You know what I mean? So when they say, how are they so jacked? Look, if I did 40 hours of physical training a week, I hope to be that fucking jacked. There's guys, there's guys at my gym, MMA guys that do like two sessions of weightlifting a week for like 45 minutes. The rest of it is fight training. These guys look like men's physique competitors because they fucking fight all the goddamn time. You have a fucking person like me trying to choke you all the time, you're going to get pretty fucking muscular just doing that, just on sheer volume. Is it radically inefficient for the purpose of hypertrophy? Oh, yeah, hell yeah. Uh, is it, you know, the best way to go about getting in shape for CrossFit or MMA or whatever? Totally. I guess it's similar to, like, um, maybe if it's, someone's a farm or a builder, like, they're lifting all the time, and they're, they're always kind of semi, like, in good shape, and it's just through what they're doing. 100%. You do enough physical work, you will be in some kind of shape. Or the uh, velodrome kind of cyclists who have insane yes. quads. <laughs> they also squat nowadays. Yeah. You look at their quads in the 70s, they weren't that impressive. But, uh, but yeah, you use the quads enough, they will be, I mean, not that impressive. They're super impressive unless you talk about competitive bodybuilders. Nowadays, these guys have quads that are impressive by competitive bodybuilding standards. So Robert Forsteman or whatever, it's just it's shit. something happened to his legs, I, I just can't explain, so... Awesome. Um, so we will call it there. I think we've been about an hour, covered a load of questions. I think the people always enjoy these podcasts. I want to say a massive thank you again to Mike, as always, for coming on and uh, answering these. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, we still have plenty more. We'll probably um, get another one of these scheduled in future. And we will talk to you guys soon. If you've got anything, um, I know the diet book is in works at the moment. Has it, has it got much further? Do you have a date? November. Amazing. When does this come out? So this, hmm, it will probably come out before then, I would imagine. Well, it's August now. Yeah, it'll come out before November for sure. Sweet. Diet book coming soon. <laughs> yeah, it will come soon. We're, I can't remember how many episodes ahead we are now, but guys, be aware that yeah, we have, we're in the 120s already recorded and we're on 115 just now. So this will probably come out in yeah, a number, like a couple of Better to be ahead than behind. <laughs> awesome. Right. Cheers, guys. We'll catch you soon. Peace.